let's let's just go into the history uh, a little bit of Ticketmaster. It, I, I have to say that when I read the piece, like it it all sort of came back to me. Like I. I grew up in Boston area. I remember Don Law. I remember like the sort of the evolution of these things. I remember when, um, you know, Eddie Vedder and uh, Pearl Jam uh, did this stuff. And I, you know, being skeptical of what their motives were because I was a fan of Nirvana, like, you know, pre, you know, like uh, uh, Teen Spirit. And so I was just skeptical of the whole thing and didn't pay that much attention. And now I feel like an ass for that. So, um, what, uh, Mo, do you want to start with like, maybe like that early history of, of Ticketmaster? Uh, yeah, I was definitely on team Kurt, um, in the, in those squabbles. I was 15 when this was happening. So I remember it pretty vividly and I remembered more what happened afterwards in terms of just the tsunami of consolidation in the entertainment industry that took something that I thought was pretty great, which was American pop culture of the early nineties um, and turned it into just this um, really like tyrannically vacuous cesspool. Um, and as it turns out, these things were connected. It kind of all started with um, the crushing of Pearl Jam. Um, but w w where it really started was in the 80s. Um, and there were a couple of moguls um, and the concert promoter, there was this sort of loosely... Uh, organized cartel of regional concert promoters that Ticketmaster kind of um, lent money to, to, to bid up um, the prices of, of uh, you know, high, high profile acts and, um, and split the fees with. Um, so there, the CEO of Ticketmaster back in the uh, 80s um, with this guy, Fred Rosen, and his friend, Irving Azoff, who at the time was CEO of MCA, um, they really were almost plotting, I feel like, in, in the 80s to dominate the music industry and um, and we're living that reality today. But um, Pearl Jam. And can I just add, I just want to say, you know, just for, for context, the 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 early to mid to late 80s seemed to be and, and maybe I'm wrong, but seemed to be the absolute pinnacle of like the touring uh, world of, of concerts. I mean, I, I, I worked at a, at a parking lot in Worcester next to our civic center and it was, I mean, it was constant. Like it was a 13,000, uh, uh, a person arena and it was booked every weekend. Like the touring was amazing at that time. Um, I think that there was it, there there was definitely a really vibrant scene, and back then it was like I said, it was a loosely um, controlled cartel. There were a lot of um, of very powerful promoters. Um, they were putting a lot of money. There was a there's a legendary Canadian promoter named Michael Cole who um, who offered the Rolling Stones like fifty five million dollars for one concert tour, and this was like unheard of back in the day. And I'm pretty sure that that money was fronted by Ticketmaster. Um, so that kind of got this whole thing off the ground where every big act really felt like they needed to tour every year. Um, and um, it, uh, it, it gradually turned into um, a more sort of centrally controlled and, um, and now it's much more kind of, it's, it's a less extravagant industry. There's a lot more cost cutting, a lot more classic corporate um, bullshit. <clears throat> Well, let's, uh, Krista, talk about uh, those hearings uh, with with Pearl Jam because the, and and how they, you know, sort of like, um, I guess, um, you know, sort of decided like why they had a problem with Ticketmaster and then how they got sort of like pulled in to testify um, and how they just got crushed after that. Yeah, it's a pretty depressing part of the story, but basically they wanted to make their tour affordable and Ticketmaster was demanding a higher fee attached to their face value. They wanted to keep it under $20. So they decided like we're going to basically attempt a tour avoiding Live Nation and Ticketmaster's services, really just Ticketmaster's services. Um and amidst all that, they came up against a bunch of retaliatory behavior where venues had ticketing services shut off kind of inexplicably so. Um, and then immediately, like right before the concert turned back on, but definitely a threatening move from Ticketmaster. And 
amongst all this, you know, they were pretty public about it. Uh, and the DOJ asked them to write a complaint. The DOJ had been kind of watching Ticketmaster ever since 1991 when they merged with Ticketron. Uh, although that merger probably should have been blocked, it wasn't. And so the DOJ, yeah, basically said, can you to help us kind of announce an investigation, write a complaint about what you've experienced. So they did, and the DOJ, you know, announced an investigation, but within a year uh, after the hearing, it was dropped with like a two sentence explanation. It kind of made no sense that the explanation was, well, there appears to be competition or like venues are, are willingly going into these uh, agreements. So it can't be a monopoly. But when you kind of like uncover what actually happened, there was a lot of pretty blatant corruption, actually, where Phil Graham, who was the head of the Appropriations Committee at the time, had a, um, a very close relationship with this man, Charlie Black, who was a strong lobbyist. His wife was the head of government affairs. They hired her in the midst of all of these investigations. Um, to be Ticketmaster's head of government affairs. So there's just a, a bunch of inner workings that I wish we had more to uncover, but we definitely at least highlighted a little bit of it. And to be clear, when you say set the ticket prices, the, the, and I don't think people sort of like, I, I certainly didn't understand this at the time, that Ticketmaster would, that the, the way that, that prices get, I mean, the way that tickets get priced, I mean, it's not like, we're going to charge 20 bucks and Ticketmaster says, okay, well, we take our 10%. And then so the ticket will cost 21 bucks. They actually set the prices of the tickets? Well, so uh, Pearl Jam will say, we want to price our ticket. Uh, Mo, do you remember the exact pricing they had for that tour, the 1995 tour? They um, they determined basically that they would need to, it to it be like around $18, 18 to 18. break even. So they were only trying to break even. Pearl Jam had sold a monstrous number of records. They were just looking to not lose money on the tour because they regularly did lost, lose money playing charity events. Um, and, and then they tack on, yeah, so it was Ticketmaster that said, we'll tack on this $2 above a $2 fee. Yeah. What it was was that- Pearl Jam wanted $2. When, yeah, when Pearl Jam wanted to, to not go above $2 and, and what Ticketmaster really resented was that Pearl Jam was trying to negotiate. They were kind of looking down the, the whole kind of supply chain and Ticketmaster really reserved the right to make the service charges whatever they needed to be to pay off all of the ancillary middlemen involved. And that was sort of- Wait, the, Mo, can I time in there? Sure. It's, when they say- um like what's what Ticketmaster needs. Ticketmaster gained almost all of its power through these exclusive contracts with venues that they would pay an upfront charge. It was like $500,000 at times to the venue to gain exclusivity and jack up fees for the customer to cover that. So it was like, we're going to loss lead almost and then regain a recoup through fees from the from the fans and that had never been the case before and they did and this is sort of like a it's like a pre kickback right i mean that's basically what it is it's a it's a kickback but it comes you're reversing the sort of like uh the the sequencing of the kickback so mm -hmm. you're you're eliminating before there's even and people should understand what what this dynamic is before there's even a tour before even pearl jam's there they have basically purchased, they've basically rented almost every uh, facility or the only, or they've bought options on all these facilities and, and you need us before anybody, before there's even an act. And then they, uh, it's, it's basically just a kickback. And they right. recoup the funds through the service fees. Yeah. They, they extended loans. I mean, by the nineties, the, um, the, uh, advances that they would give to venues were up to $5 million, but they also gave non-recourse loans to concert promoters to front the money that they needed to bid on the act. So that's again, how, um, and, and, and rock stars in a lot of cases, they didn't like this game, but they didn't see any way of sort of, um, going against it, especially after Pearl Jam with Pearl Jam, what they were trying to do is teach a lesson and it worked. Um, 
the uh, what what strikes me about all of this is that this is happening in the the late eighties. Uh, I mean, or, or you know, in in the nineties, right around the time, or right in the buildup to uh, the Clinton administration uh, signing off and 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 happening in Congress, the rescinding of the uh, the the FinCEN laws. And because this is really a similar, you know, dynamic. These were laws that existed in this country for about 70 years at the time that uh, basically said you cannot own a movie theater if you're a movie studio because you'll only feature movies from your own studio if you own the theater. And that's going to suck for people who want to see a bunch of different movies or it's going to cost more to see a movie from a rival studio or something like that. And they have basically instituted in some, you know, slightly different way. But the dynamic is it's basically a, like a, a financial interest syndication type of a relationship where they, they're getting paid on both ends and they're excluding anybody else, any type of competition whatsoever. Exactly. Absolutely. And actually, um, the gentleman from Jam Production, so there's a, a one of the lone remaining um, independent concert promoters um, who didn't sell out to this this network, really. It was called Clear Channel. Um, first, it was called SFX, and it was Clear Channel, then Live Nation, now Ticketmaster. Um, in the 90s, they all kind of got rolled up and consolidated by this guy, Bob Sillerman. And uh, one of the guys who didn't sell out um, owned a promoter called Jam Productions in Chicago. They've been really, really vocal about um, this this whole issue. And they brought up the uh, FinCEN laws yesterday um, and uh, at, the, at the hearing and gave some really great testimony 